I think what's fascinating about Mozart in particular is our preconceptions when it comes to his music, the, the myth of Mozart, the, the baggage we all bring to Mozart one way or the other. You know, that's different degrees of baggage, but some of us have just seen the movie Amadeus and, you know, we think of that whole, you know, wonderful Hollywood drama. Um, but then there are others uh, like myself who have actually been playing the music of Mozart and growing up with it since I was six or seven. Already at that age, when I was six or seven, um, my parents and piano teacher were sort of thrusting the myth of Mozart upon me, telling me about the genius of all geniuses, the wunderkind, the prodigy of all prodigies of all time, and almost like scaring you with the incredible divine kind of gift of Mozart. And he did have that divine gift. I remember when I was seven, I saw The Magic Flute. It was the first opera I ever saw. And, and at the end of it, I was kind of pale in my seat because I thought Mozart probably wrote The Magic Flute when he was seven. But of course, Mozart was not seven. He was in the last year of his life when he wrote it. But, but the feeling of Mozart is always this kind of, I can't touch him, you know, because he's, he's so beyond uh, the ordinary, you know, human people like me and, and the rest of us. Yeah. And then, you know, you have to come to terms with Mozart and you have to you have to go so deeply and spend so much time with him to to feel free in his music to feel less inhibited you know uh, in it and I think what I was fascinated by with this album Mozart and Contemporaries is basically that uh, idea of Mozart as the Wunderkind is to me actually you know a rather misleading idea I mean he was very talented as a young man but let's say he died when he was 25 and not 35, which is the case. If he had died 10 years earlier, um, he would not be Mozart to us in the same way. He would, of course, be one of the greats in history and all that, and he would be one of the supreme young talents. But he really became Mozart, the way we understand him, in the last 10 years of his life, not as the Wunderkind, but rather as a grown-up. And that's when his music fundamentally changes, I mean, really changes. Uh, and there are many reasons for that. You know, one reason is that 10 years before he died, he discovered the music of Johann Sebastian Bach, and that really opened up all well, these floodgates of new ideas for him. But it's also to do with everything else. You know, he was no longer in fashion with the aristocracy. You know, he wasn't the little puppet, the little favorite, you know, child of, of, of the gods. And so, so they rejected him, and there were many people who were jealous, you know, towards him, and he had to really restart himself and it didn't go so well for him it went okay for a time and then he really fell out of fashion and the interesting thing is that you know the greater the music became the less popularity he had it reached the point that you know he was trying to sell a subscription to a published work the, the string quintets the late quintets and he only could gather one subscriber you know in vienna one person which shows in you know, he so he had sunk that low in popularity but but the music was really gone going to the spheres you know it was really going into the future, into the 19th century, it was unbelievable. And those extremes in his life fascinate me. And the fact that in these 10 years, if we wouldn't have those 10 years, if he had died 25, we would not have the great operas. You wouldn't have Don Giovanni, the magic flute, Cosi van Tutte, the marriage of Figaro. You wouldn't have the late symphonies. You wouldn't have the late piano music, the great piano concertos. You would not have them. You know, they, they were all written in these 10 years. Uh, the late, you know, it's like the, the, the string chair music is some of the greatest chair music that has ever been written. And this he did sort of when he was on his personal quest for freedom, both artistically and personal, personally. You know, he was fighting away from the overwhelming influence of his not so nice father. He married the love of his life, Constanza Weber, to the disgrace of the father, and it was a, it was a huge rift. Uh, he, he basically, you know, is in a society that's changing. You know, in 1789, two years before he dies, you have the French Revolution that would change the social structure for all years to come. And it's really a bad thing that Mozart died so young. And sometimes we pretend that everything is the way it should be and, and this was meant to be like that. It wasn't. Mozart really belonged to the 19th century in spirit. He was, he was the first romantic artist. 
And he was the first indie artist as well, because when the aristocracy turned their backs on him, he actually started his own concert series, hired musicians, hung up posters, sold tickets from his apartment in Vienna himself. He did everything, you know. Constanza, his widow, would say that he actually died from overwork, you know. But he, he belonged to a new era where the artist was a free thinker and not a servant of capital. Uh, and, and that's the great tragedy for music history that he died so early. Imagine if he had had more time and would have had a dialogue with Ludwig van Beethoven, who after all was only 14 years younger than Mozart, uh, even if we feel like they're almost in different worlds.